I heard about a young, young boy named Eddie that was spending Christmas with his grandparents, and on Christmas, uh, Christmas morning, the family went to church. And while they were waiting to go in, there was two services, they were waiting to move into the uh, auditorium. Eddie was checking out the announcements and the pictures on the walls, and he came to a group of pictures of men in uniform, and he asked his grandfather, who are all those men in the pictures? And his grandfather replied, well, those are our men who died in the service. Dumbfounded, little Eddie asked, well, was it the Christmas Eve service or the Christmas Day service? I think he was a little worried. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you this morning about releasing your Christmas miracle. I want to share a principle today that probably many of you are familiar with. There might be some that are not. But if we can get a hold of this principle that really runs all through the Bible, we can release blessings that God has in store for us. And usually, you know, when we think of Christmas miracles, we, we think, of course, of the birth of Jesus, the Virgin Mary uh, giving birth. Uh, but there was another Christmas miracle that maybe doesn't get quite as much attention. It was another baby that was born miraculously and uh, about six months before Jesus was born. And his name was John. The little guy's name was John. He ended up becoming John the Baptist. The Bible said that he prepared the way for the Messiah to come. He had a very important role in the kingdom of God. So this Christmas miracle, it involved two elderly people, a couple named Zacharias and Elizabeth. Zacharias was a priest. Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron, the brother of Moses, the high priest. These folks were good people. Uh, they did their best to serve the Lord. They did their best to obey God, to follow the, you know, the commands of the Scripture, Luke 1, 6. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 if you want to turn in your Bible or your phone or your tablet there. The Bible says in verse 6 that both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. Yet, despite their righteous living, despite their purposes in the kingdom of God at that point, there was an unfulfilled area in their life. There was one thing that they longed for more than anything else in life, but yet it had eluded them all of their life. Like every Jewish couple in their day, it was very important to have children. Having children, being able to have children was a sign, at least in the Jewish mind, of the blessing and the favor of God upon their lives. Psalms 127 verse 3 says, children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring are a reward from Him. I'm sure there's no parent here that probably hasn't questioned that scripture at some point in their life, particularly when your kids get to the teen years. You sure about this reward thing, Lord? Goes on to say, like arrows in the hand of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Now your quiver might be full of at one or two. Some people, their quiver isn't full until they get maybe five or six. But Zacharias' quiver was absolutely empty. Here they are, elderly couple, all their life praying for this miracle. It never came. They were elderly. It just seemed like that dream had faded from their life like a, like a morning fog in the sun. And they didn't know why. Uh, you know, was there, you know, was it a curse from God? I, I, as, as much as having children was a blessing in the Jewish mind, not having children was often viewed as a curse, as almost disapproval from God. That wasn't the case here. There was no hidden sin in their lives. There was no area of compromise. You know, they weren't trying to live with one foot in the kingdom, one out. They were doing their very best to live for God, yet they were disappointed. There was an area of unfulfillment and emptiness in their life. Now, it was a custom for priests in those days to take turns going into the, king, into the temple and just doing the, the work and the ministry in the temple. And so it came that it was Zacharias' time to go into the temple. And so here he was, he was inside doing whatever the things uh, priests do. And then suddenly the Bible says, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, 
and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or ferment a drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many from the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents of the children and the children and the uh, hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared to the Lord. Zacharias' first response out of his mouth, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. So listen, he had been praying, his wife had been praying for a miracle for years, for probably decades, suddenly an angel appears to him and says, God's heard your prayer. The miracle is on the way. The thing that has eluded you, that dream that you've wanted all of your life is about ready to be manifest. And the only thing that can come out of his mouth is, I, I don't know about this, Lord. I'm not really sure about this. You know, I'm thinking with a a visitation from an angel like that and a message from God, Zacharias should have been dancing out of that temple with his feet off the ground. I mean, people should have been hearing him two blocks away shout for joy, but instead the first words out of his mouth were filled with doubt and skepticism. How can I be sure of this? Lord, I'm an old dude. And my wife, she's not much of a spring chicken either. So as a result of Zacharias' doubt and skepticism, the angel had this follow-up message. He said, I am Gabriel. He's one of the big guys up there. I stand in the presence of God. I've been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. But because of those words of doubt, because of those words of skepticism, now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day that this happens. Why? Because you did not believe my words which will come true at their appointed time. You know, it may appear to some that God just got ticked off at Zacharias and decided, well, I'm just going to make you mute for that as a punishment. But I don't believe it was a punishment that God made him mute. I believe it was the mercy of God. Zacharias was about ready to mess the whole thing up. He was about ready to nullify God's promise and answer to prayer with his doubt filled words. I tell you, this is a lesson for all of us, and this is really what I want to talk about is the amazing power of our words when we speak them in faith and they line up with the Word of God. You know, as people made in God's image, uh, God's given us the privilege of, of just laying hold of or claiming the promises of God and our, our speaking what God has said to us is a very real means of us taking hold of what He has said He wants us to have. There's much power in our words. Words are containers of power. Would you just tell your neighbor that right now, that words are a container of power? Now turn to your, your other neighbor and say, your words are containers of power too. He's talking about you this morning. You know, when God wanted to create the earth and the universe, He didn't do it through thoughts. How did He do it? He did it with words. When He wanted light, did He just say, think light? No. He spoke, let there be light, right? When He wanted fish in the sea, what did He say? He said, let the sea teem with all kinds of, you know, living things. When He wanted stars in the sky, He said, let there be stars, let there be moon, let there be sun. God spoke, and through the power of His words, it was done. Romans 4, 17 says, Abraham believed in God. And what kind of God is this? What kind of God are we talking about? Well, it's the God who gives life to the dead. And listen to this. He calls things into existence that do not exist. You know, God's given us creative power. He's, he's a creative God. He's given us creative ability. But we create things out of things that already exist. You know, an artist creates uh, out of a canvas and paint. A sculptor creates out of clay. But when God creates, he uses words to create substance and things out of absolutely nothing. Romans 4.17 4, in the New Living Translation says this, Abraham believed 
in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. He creates new things out of nothing. How does he do that? He does it with words. Isaiah 55, 10 said, as the rain and the snow, hold on, just stick with me. Some of you guys are looking at me like a cow at a new gate. What, what is he talking about? God speaking words and creation. Just hold on, we're gonna get there. As the rain and the snow came down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it butter flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for food, so is my word, he's talking about God's word, spoken out of his mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. When God speaks a word, it never returns to him empty. It never returns to him void. The Bible says that it accomplishes the thing that he sent it to do. I want to read this verse in three other versions. Another version says, my words succeed in doing what I sent them to do. Living Bible says, my words accomplish all I want them to and prosper everywhere I send it. Here's the message version. My words, they work. They'll do the work that I sent them to do. And listen to this. They'll complete the assignment that I gave them. My words are going to complete the assignment that I gave them. God's words have assignment. Every single word God speaks has an assignment. Every word in this book has an assignment. And many of those assignments have your name on it. When God speaks a word, those words are released to complete the assignment that he has given to those words to complete in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your body, in our city, in our nation. Every time we speak the word of God, there is an assignment that's connected with those words. I don't know about you, I'm starting to get happy already when I think about this. And you might be thinking, well, that's cool. I mean, isn't that cool that God can do that? But he's God and I'm not. Remember that? But I want to tell you, this is such a key truth. As people made in his image, God has given us this power to release kingdom miracles, to release his power, hallelujah, through the spoken word, just as he does. We're made in his image. Not only that, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. He's created us to operate just like he does, to see things by faith, to see things not with the natural eye, but to see things that are existent in the spiritual realm, to speak words that line up with his word, and to see those things created sometimes out of absolutely nothing. Anybody want to get in on this? You take a double dose of that. You know, when a born-again believer speaks the words of God in faith, those words will succeed in accomplishing their God-given assignment. I'm going to give you a few verses. We're not just throwing out these things without background in the Scripture. Romans 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of what? That, a little piece of meat in your mouth. That is so powerful, James says. It's just a little member, but boy, it's powerful. For the negative, yes, but also for the positive as well. So why it's so important that we need to guard our mouth. Make sure we're speaking God's word, words that line up with, with God. Paul said, make sure that you're speaking life. Let no corrupt word come from your mouth. You know what the word corrupt means? Rotten. It's like those vegetables that you stuck in the back of your refrigerator and forgot about them, and about four weeks later you pull them out, and they're absolutely rotten, and they stink. And, and, and God says, sometimes the words out of our mouth are like that, and they produce death. Our words, have the, they're containers of power. They have the power to produce death, but hallelujah, they also have the power to produce life. Amen. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with the heart that you believe and are justified. It doesn't stop there. It's not just enough to believe in God. Even the demons believe in God. But it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. The very entrance, your very entrance into the kingdom of God 
came about because you believed something in your heart and then you spoke some words out of your mouth. You confessed that Jesus Christ was Lord and instantly a miracle happened in your spirit. You were instantly born again. The life of God, old things have passed away and all things have become new. You're a new creation in Jesus Christ. Why? Because you believe some things and you spoke some words and a miracle occurred. Amen. And did you know every other blessing comes into your life just the same way? Yeah. By believing what God has said and speaking those words out of your mouth, that same miracle power is released in your life, whether it's an assignment to bring healing to your body, whether it's an assignment to release blessing into your finances, whether it's an assignment to restore your broken marriage, it all works the same way. God's already blessed us with everything that we need. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse somewhere around 3 or 4, it says God has blessed us, is blessed past, present, or future tense. Blessed. Has blessed. Is that past tense or future tense? That's past tense. God has blessed us. Already done in the heavenly realms. With just a few things, just a few crumbs in the kingdom that you can somehow get by with. No, it says by, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. God has already done it. Everything that He's going to do in your life, He's already provided it for you. It's in the kingdom. How do we release it? By believing some things and speaking some things. I believe that every promise in the Bible is voice activated. I used to have a little tape recorder, a little digital tape recorder that was voice activated. And uh, when I wanted to record something, if I wanted to dictate something, I would, I would just set it on the voice activating uh, function and it wouldn't do anything. It would just sit there until I started speaking. And when I started speaking, that mechanism was designed to pick up on my voice and to start recording. It would record as long as I continue to speak. The moment I stopped speaking, the whole mechanism shut down and nothing was happening. I believe that's exactly the way it is in the kingdom of God. God has already blessed us. God wants to work. The angels of God are released to, to help you and to minister to you. All of heaven's resources are ready to be released in your life, but God is just waiting for somebody to get a hold of his promises, to put them in their heart, and to begin to declare them out of their mouth, voice activated, and release not only your Christmas miracle, but any miracle you need the rest of the year as well. Hallelujah. Now, I know some people are thinking, you know, Pastor, I heard that a few years ago. I tried that once, and it didn't work. It doesn't happen just because you tried it once. It happens because you believe the Word of God. You believe this principle is true. And you get a hold of the Word of God and sink your teeth in it no matter what's going on, no matter what contrary circumstances are happening in your life. If you're, if you're, if you're believing God for, for healing in your body, but yet those symptoms persist, then you don't give up because you tried it once and it didn't work. You keep your teeth sunk into the Word of God and you keep declaring that and declaring that and declaring that and at some point that thing, that miracle, that power is going to be released and manifest in your, in your body. We got a dog, he's a Gordon Setter, his name is Quincy, I named him after Quincy Jones, the old jazz piano player and composer because I like jazz music. Um, Quincy loves to play tug-of-war. He's got this old green blanket that's all full of holes now. But that's his favorite game. When I come home, he runs and grabs that, grabs that green blanket and runs over and shakes it in front of me like, come on, Dad, let's, let's play. And so I, most of the time I play with him. I get a hold of that, that uh, little green blanket. He gets in the, the hold of the other hand and he begins to pull. And I tell you, that dog has a grip like you wouldn't believe. He literally sinks his, his teeth into the fabric of that, uh, that little blanket, and he won't let go. I can literally, he's like 45 pounds, I can literally pick him up 
off of the ground and he won't let go. I was thinking about that this week. We need to be like that with the promises of God. We need to sink our teeth into God's provision and in His God's Word and into His promises to us and simply not let go, no matter what happens, no matter what the devil tries to do, no matter what circumstances try to persist, we are not going to let go. I want to look at uh, two groups of people in the Bible. One group got it wrong, and then another guy got it right. So maybe we can learn something from it. Turn in your Bible to Romans, excuse me, not Romans, but Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. This this principle can really literally change your life if you get a hold of it. Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to look that up as well. God, a little background on this just chapter. uh, God had just delivered... Israel from 400 years of slavery to Egypt. He had demonstrated great power in the 10 plagues. And finally, Pharaoh let him go. They left, about 2 million of them. They came to the Red Sea, as you all know, because you watched the movie. The Charlton Heston. God parted the sea. And Israel walked across on dry land. When the enemies tried to pursue them, the Egyptian army tried to pursue them, God let the waters fall back on them, destroy their enemy. And and they walked on into victory. And then over the next number of days or weeks, however long it was, from that point to the point that God took him to the border of Canaan, uh, God demonstrated his power again and again. The Bible says ten different times the Israelites tested God, and God came through in miraculous power. And then finally, God brings them to the border of, of Canaan. This was the promised land. This was the land that God had promised, I'm going to give you this land. In fact, chapter 13, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men out to spy on the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Listen, this was a done deal. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say if you get in there and and do a good job and drive out the enemies, then it's it's quite possible you're going to get at least part of the land. He said, no, I'm giving you the land. It's a promise out of my mouth. All you've got to do is go in, do your part, drive out the enemies. You don't even have to do that in your own strength and ability because I'm going to empower you to do that. I'm going to drive your enemies out before you, and then you are going to possess this wonderful, amazing land that I promised you. Done deal. So Moses, he he chooses 12 men. Uh, from each of the 12 tribes, I want you to go out and spy out the land. You know, what kind of fruit, what kind of produce, you know, what do the enemies look like, all of that stuff. And so, you know, the, they return. And in verse uh, 26, if I can find 26 in my Bible, it says, And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days, and they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran, they brought back word to them and, so, and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him, We went into the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. They're saying, man, this is a, an amazing land. Then they said, nevertheless, verse 28, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land to the south. The Hittites and Jezebites and the Amorites and all kinds of ites dwell in the mountain. The Canaanites dwell in the sea and along the banks of the Jordan. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let's go up at once and take possession for we are well able to to take it, well able to overcome it. You know, Caleb saw the same giants that the other ten spies. Caleb and Joshua saw the same giants, same walled cities, same obstacles that the other ten spies had, but they had a different report. How many know faith declares the power of God in the face of the problem? Faith isn't blind. Faith doesn't stick its head in the sand and say, well, there's no problem, like the Christian science, you know, we're just going to think it's not there, and so it's not there. That's not the way it works. I mean, if you've got an illness in your body, you can't pretend it's not there, and then it goes away. No, you've got to face the fact 
face the reality. If your marriage has fallen apart, if your finances are in ruin, you can face that fact. Faith isn't blind, but it also declares the power of God in the face of the problem. Hallelujah. Verse 31. But the men who had gone up with him said, we're not able to go up against this people. Listen to the words that are coming out of their mouth. God says, I've given you the land. And what do they say? We can't do it. They're too strong. They're stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report. One verse says, an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. (laughs) And all the people we saw in them were men of great stature. Then we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. That was the report that they had. What were they saying? God, we can't do it. They're too big. You're too small. I just don't see how it's going to happen. And their negative report literally surged through two two million people like windblown wildfire. And suddenly, two million people were speaking the same thing. God, we can't do it. They're too big. We're not able. And they begin to rehearse that over and over again. And as a result of the words that they spoke out of their mouth, the Bible says there's not going to be a single adult 20 years or older that's going to enter in and receive the inheritance, the promised land, except Caleb and Joshua, the two men who had a different report. The Bible says they had a different spirit. Caleb had a different spirit than the rest of them. They had a spirit of doubt and fear and unbelief. Caleb had a spirit of faith. Their God was too small. Caleb said, God, you're able. You're well able. And because you're able, we're able. Because we're empowered by your strength and your ability. Words are containers of power. Death and life is in the power of the tongue. And we get to choose which of the fruit we'll eat, death or life. Let's look at a man who got it right. Abraham. Just like Zacharias, he was an old man who had uh, desired to have a child all of his life, but that dream had eluded him. But then one day God, when he was 75 years old, God showed up, gave him a promise. He said, you're going to have a child. And it's not going to be through your concubine or Sarah's handmaiden. It's going to be through your wife, Sarah. It's going to be a marriage. He was 75 years old. Sarah was 10 years younger than that, 65. But she had been barren all of her life. They were past the age of bearing children, or at least she was anyway. For 25 years, Abraham, his faith was tested. 25 years. I believe he had many opportunities to get into doubt Many opportunities to get into skepticism. I believe it would have been just as easy for him as it was for those 10 spies to say, I don't see how it's going to happen. I, 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 I don't understand. I mean, I'm, I'm way past the age of bearing children. My wife is past the age of bearing children. I'm sure the enemy taunted him over and over again. Hey, that promise isn't going to happen in your life. You were just imagining things. You can't really count on God. But Abraham had that same spirit that Caleb had, a different spirit, a spirit of faith. In Romans 4.18, it says, against all hope, hope in the natural, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, 25 years, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old before he finally gave before they had, finally had a child, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. I believe that's one of the best definitions of faith in all the Bible. Yeah, we got a, Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But I believe this is a wonderful definition of what faith is. It's being fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he's promised to do. Being fully persuaded. What's the difference between the two? Israel doubted God's ability to fulfill his promise in their life. 
They focus on the giants. They focus on the obstacles. And before you criticize them, guess what? We kind of fall into that same category many times. I've been there many, many times. You know, we get focused on our symptoms rather than the healer. We get focused on our financial need rather than the provider, right? We get focused on our enemies rather than the fact that Jesus is the conquering king over our enemies. You know, the psalmist said in Psalms 23, 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemy. The Bible never acknowledges or never tries to convince us, convince us that there's no enemies in our life. We've spent in the last several weeks talking about our enemies, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these spiritual forces in the heavenly realms who are coming, seeking to steal, kill, and destroy in our life. Yes, there are enemies, but the Bible also acknowledges that there is a table that is spread before us in the presence of our enemies. It's going to be great if God just eliminated our enemies, right? God, why don't you just make all the enemies go away? He is going to do that one day. Every single enemy you have will be vanquished into the pit of hell forever, and you'll never have to encounter them again. But in the meantime, we live in an environment that's surrounded by enemies. But bless God, there is a table that God has prepared before us in the presence of our enemies. There's healing on the table. You're not nearly as excited as you should be over that. I said there's healing on the table. Jesus told one woman, healing is the children's bread. So if you need healing today, Jesus, pass the bread. <laughs> pass the bread. There's financial provision on the table. The Bible says, my God shall supply half of your needs. No, he said, my God shall supply all of your needs. According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus, there's financial provision on the table. Man, there's joy on the table. If you're down, if you're depressed, if you're heavy today, I want to tell you there's joy on the table. The psalmist said in Psalm 16, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. You don't, it's not something that you've got to work up. In fact, it's not anything you can work up. It's not some, some kind of an emotionalism, some kind of work your emotions up. No, it's the unfailing, uh, unending reservoir of God's joy that begins to bubble up on the inside of us no matter what's going on in your life. How many know your happiness is depending on what happens to you? And if things are going right, things are going your way, and the blessings are flowing, then you are happy. Hallelujah. Yeah. This nation, our Constitution, gives us the right to pursue happiness. But joy, on the other hand, is totally independent of any kind of circumstance in your life. You can have joy when everything is going wrong in your life. You can have your joy when your wife gives you no respect, like Rod Rodney Dangerfield said. I, I get no respect. Hallelujah. I'm going to take this jacket off because I'm getting hot. I like what Habakkuk said in, in uh, Habakkuk chapter 3. He says, though the fig tree does not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vine, no her in the stalls. What was going on? An enemy had come in and literally ravaged the nation, destroying the produce, driving them into caves and holes in the ground, and it was just a terrible terrible time to live, but in the middle of all that, it says, Habakkuk says, even though all that's going on, yet I will joy in the God of sal my salvation. God the Lord is my strength, Amen. and he sets my feet on the high places. I can joy. I can rejoice. You know what the word rejoice means? I wouldn't even plan on saying either. You know what the word rejoice means? It literally means to return to the source of your joy. What's the source of your joy? I mean, if it's in your bonus, end of the year bonus, it may or may not come, depending on how well the company goes. If it's in your kids growing up and doing all the right things all the time, serving God from day zero all the way up, 
it may not work out that way. If your joy is in something that physical that can be taken from you, what kind of foundation is that? But if your joy is in God, if your joy is in the one who never changes, I change not. God said, Malachi, I change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is that unending, totally reliable source of joy in your life. You can get up with joy. You can go through the day with joy. You can go to bed with joy. David prayed, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Even if you lose it, you can get it back. Where am I? There's wisdom on the table. Anybody need wisdom? I prepare a table before you in the presence of my enemies. What, what, what's on the table, Lord? Is it an empty table? No. There's healing. There's provision. There's joy. There's wisdom. There's guidance. If you don't know which way to go, you're confused. I don't know. Should, should I marry this person? Should I go to that? There's guidance on the table. I'll tell you what, everything that you need for life and godliness is on the table. Our only job is to keep our eyes fixed on the table and not on the enemies. Is there enemies? Yeah, they're surrounding us. But I'm taking my eyes off of the enemy and I'm putting it on the table. I'm putting on the provision of God. I'm putting it on the, on the promises of God. I'm gonna sink my teeth into God's word. Hallelujah. That's what Abraham did. It would have been so easy to focus on everything that was, that was wrong, everything that was broken, everything that wasn't working. He could have just kept saying, you know, I'm too old, my wife's too old, the plumbing doesn't work anymore, hallelujah. I want to tell you, God has the ability to restore the plumbing or restore anything else in your life that's broken. Angel appeared to Mary one time and says, For, with God, nothing, nothing, nothing is impossible. Think about that circumstance that's robbing you of your joy right now. Think about that dream that you've had and, and, and it just seems like it's fading like, like a mist in the, in the summer sun. Just remember, remind yourself there's nothing, nothing, nothing impossible for this God that we serve. Hallelujah. You know, when we, when we understand this and we begin to believe that our God is not too small, He's a big God, and we begin to take the Word of God, and then we not only get it on the inside, but we could declare it out, begin to speak it out. That's so important. That's how we activate the promise of God. That's how we activate the power, voice activated. We begin to do that. I tell you what, God can turn barrenness into fruitfulness. He can change your circumstances. You can experience a Christmas miracle right now, this season, today even, this week, and every day the rest of the year. Hallelujah. Begin to declare God's word over your broken marriage, over your broken finances, anything that's wrong in your life. Hallelujah. God's word does not go forth void. The end of the story with John, you know the end of the story. God shut him up for nine months. He couldn't speak. Probably the best thing that happened to him. Might be a good thing if God shut us up for about nine months and we couldn't speak. And the only thing we could do was listen. Listen to God, number one. Start listening to the people around you. Start listening to your spouse instead of trying to get the last word in all the time. Ooh, I know I just stepped on somebody's toes right there. I know that's not you, right? You don't try to get the last word in, right? So many people do, though. And instead of listening to what their partner's saying, they're trying to think of their next argument before they even get done. It would be a good thing if we were silent for about not. Maybe those monks had a good idea after all. Be quick to listen, the Bible says. Slow to speak, slow to become angry. Quick to listen. Be a good thing. That's what happened with John. Nine months, I believe he was listening to God. Nine months, he was waiting on the miracle. He didn't have the ability to speak out words of doubt and unbelief and nullify it. Praise God for his mercy. When those nine months were over, the miracle happened, and the very first words out of John's mouth at that point were praise and worship. 
and a prophetic utterance declaring the power and the majesty and the glory of God. Hallelujah. You know, he almost nullified his miracle. I wonder how many times we nullify the miracle that God has already prepared for. It's got your name on it. It's a package already in heaven. God's waiting to deliver it, but we nullify it by the words that we speak. God, I can't do it. I don't see how it's going to happen. My wife's never going to change. My husband's never going to change. My finances will never change. I'll never get that job that I want. I'll never get that promotion. Flu season comes, I'll be the first to get it, and you are, because you said it out of your mouth. Hallelujah. But we can change that. The power of life and death is in the tongue. We get to choose. Let's stand this morning. That was maybe kind of an odd Christmas sermon, but it was just on my, mouth, on my mind this week, on my heart. I believe God put that on my mind. Why? Because he wants to do so much in your life. He wants to release so much blessing in your life, but we have to cooperate with him. We have to participate with him, and we do that with our words. Begin to speak the word of God. By the way, let me just remind you, since we're on this topic, keep taking the vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine. I'm not talking about the one that's being pumped out now. I'm talking about the spiritual vaccine, Psalms 91. Whether you take the other vaccine, that's up to you. I'm not. <laughs> but there is a spiritual vaccine that can vaccinate you from any kind of plague or virus. Psalms 91 says, no harm will befall me, no disaster come near my tent. I'm not going to fear the terror by day, the arrow that flies by night, the plague that destroys at midday, or the pestilence that stalks in the darkness. I don't have to fear it. A thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but it will not come near me. That's a promise of God. That's a provision of God. But it's not just going to fall on you like ripe apples off a tree. You got to, first of all, get that word in your heart so it creates faith. And then you begin to speak that word out. I memorized that years ago. And uh, I, I, for a few months after the virus started, I mean, I got into that, man. I was into the Psalms 91. I preached two or three messages on it. I was cool. And then I got away from it. And then I started to realize that I was getting a little bit fearful again. You know, you're talking about the numbers going up again. Oh, no. Maybe I shouldn't go to Fred Meyer after all today. I don't know. Maybe I ought to just stay home. And, and God remind me, you haven't been taking your vaccination. So the last few weeks, I've got into it again. I'm speaking and declaring that thing out. Hallelujah. I don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear it. But it's voice activated. It's voice activated. What do you need from God? Are you just waiting for God to just somehow show up and figure out what you need and <laughs> have mercy on you? I encourage you to get into the Bible, find a promise that corresponds with your need, get that word on the inside of you, chew it, like you would chew a good steak, meditate on it. That's what meditation is. You just rehearse it, regurgitate it, <laughs> get it on the inside, bring it up again, think about it. And then when that thing begins to stir on the inside of you and that faith begins to rise, then you begin to declare that out. And there's no devil in hell that can stand against that word. It will complete the assignment that God has sent it to do in your life. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. Your word is powerful. Your word is majestic, the psalmist said. Your word is like thunder. Your word even strips the trees bare of their bark. Hallelujah. What a powerful word. What a powerful God you are. 
Lord, I pray that you would give us revelation of this principle. It wouldn't just be a word that we hear and say, well, that's kind of cool. Maybe I'll try it once. But Lord, we get on the inside. We begin to practice this every day. Release the word. Release the power. Release the miracle in our life. And we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.